Thank you, Beth. And thank you, Dr. Kenny and Dr. Sharma, for having me here today. Hello, everyone. My name is Christy Shellhorn, and I will be discussing the prevention of contrast-induced nephropathy utilizing our very own Dr. Moran's AKI risk score. I have no relevant financial relationships. So contrast-induced acute kidney injury is defined as the acute onset of renal injury following exposure to iodinated contrast media. Now, although this sounds simple enough, there has been a lot of controversy over this definition. Some radiologists question, how do we know for certain the damage was caused by the contrast received rather than the meds the patient's on, new hypotension or heart failure, for example? So to define it in even more detail, this is the current definitions and classifications that the nephrologists use. As you can see, all are very similar, but stage one is a serum creatinine increase 1.5 to two times the baseline. Stage two is a creatinine increase two to three times the baseline. And stage three is three times the baseline. And then you're also looking at your urine output for all of these stages as well. I think the most commonly used of these three is the KIDCO, which is on the right, um, the Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes, but all are very similar in their definitions. Now let's look at the mechanisms behind how this occurs. There is both a direct and indirect damage that can cause the kidney injury. When contrast is delivered, there is a direct toxic effect on the tubular cells. This is called osmotic nephrosis. When considering the indirect effects, the main takeaway is that the contrast induces vasoconstriction. And there's more that goes on at a cellular level, but this vasoconstriction in turn reduces glomerular blood flow and oxygen delivery. So contrast-induced kidney injury is one of the most frequent complications after an endovascular procedure and the third leading cause of AKI in hospitalized patients. Now, the incidence of contrast-induced kidney injury post-PCI does vary between about 0 to 24 percent, but this is because the tubules can regenerate and creatinine levels can return to baseline. But for some patients, they're not so lucky. And depending on certain risk factors or the urgency of the cath being maybe it's a STEMI or whatnot, there is a higher incidence of injury. And lastly, this development of AKI has been associated with worse outcomes increased hospital stay and cost, irreversible kidney injury, need for dialysis, and even death. So how do we prevent this from occurring? As you can see from this illustration, there are pre, intra, and post-procedure interventions we can perform. For example, radial access, utilizing IVIS imaging, and administering mucomest for kidney protection. However, if you ask Dr. Moran, she will tell you there are three simplified things that make the biggest impact. And these are identifying high-risk patients, hydration, and minimizing the contrast used. So now we're going to talk about each of these factors. First off, when it comes to identifying high-risk patients, this is when risk scores come to play. The Moran grading scale, which was introduced in 2004, includes eight factors that when tallied up will give a total score to predict the estimated risk score for CIN. And I'm sure a lot of these make sense to you. With a heart failure patient, you know you get renal congestion. With a diabetic patient, a lot of them already have diabetic nephropathy and the uncontrolled hyperglycemia does not help. However, Dr. Moran felt that this risk score needed to be updated as it's almost 20 years old. The research that she, Dr. Kinney, Dr. Sharma, and other physicians performed at the Mount Sinai Hospital was published in the Lancet just this past November, 2021. What very big honor, as you can see. So the study population for the new and recalibrated risk score was designed based on patients who had had a PCI at Mount Sinai Hospital from 2012 to 2020 and had creatinine measurements both before and within 48 hours after their procedure. And also they could not be on chronic dialysis. The study design was split up into two parts, 
the derivation cohort, which included all PCIs within the first five years, so 2012 to 2017, whereas the validation cohort used all the information collected during those years and then applied it to the following three years validating the data internally. And the final number of each of these cohorts, there is about 15,000 in the derivation and 6,000 in the validation. So big numbers. Furthermore, the study expanded upon two models. Model one used only pre-procedural variables, so before the patient even got onto the table, whereas model two included intra-procedure variables as well. So for example, how much contrast was used or how complex the procedure got. And as you can see here, one of the, the model on the left includes many of the similarities to the original risk score published in 2004. And each risk factor is assigned an integer score. And then additionally, module two includes those procedural factors as well. So contrast volume, procedural bleed, slow flow and complex anatomy. And then when comparing what we predict, which you can see in the orange, versus what was actually observed in the purple, one can easily see how successful this risk score is. Almost no comparison. And also, there isn't much comparison between model one and model two. There's a slight difference, but overall it shows how the pre-procedural steps we have can make a huge impact. And that leads me to our next point, hydration. This is a pre-procedural step that sometimes we as nurses don't take seriously enough. When we see the doctor's orders for IV hydration, it truly does play a major role in preventing nephropathy. When we use IV hydration, what are we doing? Well, we're increasing the GFR and decreasing the contrast concentration in the filtrate. It isn't always doable, but it is highly recommended to begin IV hydration three to six hours before the procedure and continuing it for 12 hours post-procedure, especially in the patients we know already have an elevated creatinine. At Mount Sinai, we like to bring them in early in the morning for adequate hydration. And then also for patients who have a creatinine level 1.8 or above, they are automatically admitted as they meet admission criteria. Lastly, I'll briefly touch on the importance of minimizing the contrast delivered. Contrast is one of the few modifiable risk factors we have so we as healthcare professionals should really do our part. How can we do this? Well, we can monitor how much we give. We can avoid LV grams and aortograms if we have a recent echo and avoid any test injections. We can perform timeouts with the entire team aware of the patient's GFR and creatinine level before even obtaining access. We can stage procedures if possible and display any previous angiograms on monitors for reference. We can use IVIS during PCI to help guide so we're not just blindly injecting. And with this, use guide catheters with outside holes. And finally, we can plan, as Rob mentioned, for radial access when appropriate. So in conclusion, contrast-induced AKI not only can lead to increased hospital stay and cost, but it can also lead to irreversible kidney injury and even death. The best way we can prevent this from occurring is to identify high-risk patients using risk scores, hydrate both pre and post procedure, and minimize the amount of contrast used. Sometimes we get into autopilot mode, especially in emergent situations like a STEMI, but it's often during these high-risk procedures that we don't stop and think about how much we're truly giving. So hopefully, we can all take something away from this lecture and do our part to reduce AKI. Thank you.